In this video, we're going to talk about how to master in Studio One. Hi folks, I'm Mike and I hope you're well. So we are going to be talking about how to master in Studio One or more specifically how I master in Studio One because we probably each do it a little bit differently. But before I do get stuck in, I want to just ask this question quickly in case it's not clear to you. What is mastering? So unfortunately, a lot of people seem to think that mastering is just about making things louder. And whilst that is a part of the mastering process, there's a bit more to it than that. Really, mastering is the final stage in the production process before we release our music out to the world. And we're making sure that, for example, we're meeting technical specifications, that we're going to do some final adjustments to the overall sonic properties of the music, and also, of course, making sure it's loud enough, that kind of thing. Now, years and years ago, mastering engineers had to know about different platforms like vinyl or tape for example or for radio where there had to be differences in the sonic properties depending on those platforms. Now the different platforms are things like whether you're releasing to a streaming service or whether it's for download or perhaps if you're still burning to CD. So those are considerations during mastering as well. So we're going to be looking at all of that. So the next question is should you master because an awful lot of people in forums are going to tell you don't master your own tracks. Well, mm, I think that if you can afford it, and if it's practical, yeah, send it off to a mastering engineer. A mastering engineer is more experienced, deals specifically with that task, has better equipment, all that kind of stuff. And that's fine. But I think in a lot of occasions, it's not really practical or affordable for people. So say, for example, you make cover songs for YouTube and you're releasing a song every single day. It's not really practical to send that off to a mastering engineer and it's probably not economically viable for you either. So those are a couple of considerations. Now there is a halfway house, there's some automated mas mastering services like Landa. But what I think is what you'll learn in today's video will get you a better result if you practice it a little than those automated services like that, like Landa. I mean, if nothing else, it's going to give you a bit more flexibility it's probably not going to be as good as if you send it off to a really professional and qualified and experienced mastering engineer. So that's all about mastering. Let's see how we can do it in Studio One. OK, so I've already done some basic preparation for mastering my song. I've loaded it here into the project page of Studio One. I've given it a title. I've updated things like the artist name and other information there. I've even added some artwork. The other thing I like to do at this stage is make sure that I've trimmed the beginning and the ends of the song to get rid of any unwanted silence. Now, if you don't know how to do any of those things at all, then I highly recommend you watch another video I've made, which is all about the project page. I'll put a link for that down in the description and just up above here now. If you go and watch that, you'll get familiar with how you can do those kinds of things. Then come back here and watch how we can actually do some mastering. Now, the other thing I like to do at this stage is check my loudness information. And I can do that if I've got my song selected by going up here to where it says loudness information. Now, if there is some information, I try and open up this area with the arrow, it will show. If not, then it's gonna detect the loudness here as it's doing for me now. It doesn't take very long at all. Now, what I'm looking for here is first of all to make sure that it's not clipping at all so it shouldn't be going up above zero dB. It's going to tell you if that's the case. Apart from that there's no real rules. I do like to have mine sort of peaking at around about between minus three and minus six dB but that's not a rule. You could have it as high as zero dB as long as it's not clipping but I do like to check that at this point. The other thing I like to do now is load in my reference track. So what is a reference track? Why are we going to load it in? A reference track is going to be generally a commercially track, a commercially produced track which has already been mastered and has the same kind of sonic properties that you want to have in your final result. I highly suggest you use something of the same genre and a similar kind of arrangement as well. There's not much point if yours is a piano ballad in using a heavy metal song as a reference track. They're very, very different in terms of sound and sonic properties. So for example, with my song here, it's mostly dominated with vocal and acoustic guitar.
guitar and a few other instruments at the beginning. And then there's a big crescendo at the end where a sort of an orchestra and everything else comes in. I've chosen a reference track, which is very, very similar to that indeed. Now, I'm not going to tell you what that reference track is. I'm not going to give you the name, nor am I going to play it in this video because I'll get into all kinds of issues with copyright. So just It's important to make sure that the reference track is similar to your song and what you want the final out come to be for that song. Now, something very important with the reference track is to do some volume matching. Uh, we have a problem with reference tracks in that they're already mastered, so they naturally sound much, much louder. And we're not going to make our song louder until the end. So when we're comparing our song to our reference track as we go along, it's going to naturally sound better because it's louder. That's just a little trick which happens with the human brain. Louder things equals better things. We don't want that trick to happen, so we're going to volume match it. We're going to make it sound about the same volume. It's very easy to do. So what we're going to do is I'm going for the loudest part of my song towards the end here. I'm going to play it in a moment and I'll be looking at the metering, especially at the values that I see here for the RMS. Uh, it's going to, the numbers are going to appear where my mouse is just there right now. And I'm going to be looking to see what kind of values I've got with my song there. From the start. So you can see that it's hovering around about minus 13 to minus 14 dB. That's absolutely fine. Let's go ahead and I'll go to a similar position in my reference track. As I say, I'm not going to play it for you guys, but what I know from looking at it already is that it was actually around about minus 8 dB, which is significantly louder in volume. So what I did was I went to the reference track, I selected it over here, and I just adjusted that fader down until its RMS was around about minus 13, minus 14. That means that when I switch between the two songs and I'm listening, listening to uh, similar passages, they are at a similar volume. Now, if you're finding that the numbers are the same, but to you, one sounds louder than the other, then trust your ears above the numbers. That's the most important thing. So it's normally at this stage that I start to think about any metering plugins which I'd like to add. Now, if we were in any other door at all, I'd be saying download and get this or that plugin. But in Studio One, the metering is so good, I really don't think you need a plugin for this. It dominates most of the screen, as you can see here. There's lots and lots of options for visualizing it in different ways, as well as different standards that you can view the metering in down the bottom here. So I really don't think you need anything else unless there's some some very specific metering you think you need. However, there is a plugin which I do use quite often, which falls into this category. And I'm going to show it to you now, even though it's a commercial plugin, I'm kind of recommending it because I do use it all the time, but it is optional. You don't have to have it, okay? It's called a tonal balance control. It's by Isotope. Now I insert any metering plugins into this master section down here, okay? And that's where I've inserted this one. This means it's always at the end of the chain, okay? So it's doing its metering based upon any changes I've made so far. So I'll open up this plugin here just to quickly show you what it's all about. It's got four bands, which you can see here, the low, the low mids, the high mids and the highs. And some lines are going to appear when I play the song. And it's going to indicate whether I'm falling roughly where I should be within those sort of ranges for the style that I've chosen. Now, I've chosen pop up here, but there's a few different ones to choose from. OK, now. That's just going to give me a rough guideline to tell me whether I'm in the right ballpark or not. So let's just have a quick listen to the song. So obviously I've got nothing to worry about in the top three bands. The lines are sitting nicely in there. I may be a bit heavy on the low end of things at the moment. I may want to take a look at that. Now, I don't follow this religiously. Um, there's been occasions where I've gone, you know what, I'm going to ignore the advice here. I think the low end or the high end, whatever it is, sounds fine to me. But I do find it very, very useful, especially when my ears are getting fatigued, when I've been working on a project for a while. I can't necessarily trust my ears that much anymore. To have this visual guide, I find it very, very useful or at least a great starting point. As I say, completely optional. You don't have to get this to do mastering, okay? So the next thing I do is add in an EQ plugin, and it's got one solitary task here, and that's to act as a high pass filter or a low cut filter. Those two pieces of terminology relate to exactly the same thing, by the way, 
just different terminology. So I've inserted the Pro EQ2 a stock plugin in Studio One 5 here, and I'm going to switch on that low cut filter. So I'll do that now. Now let's talk briefly about why we're doing this. We want to get rid of some low end information which we can't actually hear. Human hearing only has certain limits and it extends in the low end down to around about 20 hertz or so. But there may be some low end information which is still there. Now you may be asking asking, well, why get rid of it if we can't hear it? What difference does it make? Well, the thing is, although we can't hear it, the computer can hear it. So that information will be going through further down the chain into other plugins. And it'll affect those plugins, especially things like compressors and limiters. So for example, in theory, you could have a low end sound in isolation right down there, say at uh, minus 25 hertz, which you can't hear at all, which could entirely cause your compressor to kick in and start compressing everything else. So we don't want that to happen. So we're going to tame that low end. So I've switched that on. I'm going to change the slope here to 48 dBs here. And then I'm just going to initially adjust it to that number I was talking about, which is 20 hertz. Now, what I normally like to do here is start listening to the music. I'll listen to it over and over again, and I'll start pushing that up, pushing it up. I'll get to a certain point, maybe maybe it's something like 30 hertz, and I'll start to A, B. So I'll switch the plug-in off and on. And I'm going to start to see if I hear any difference. Now, say I get to this point here, you know, 25 decibels or so, and when I'm switching between the two, I start to hear a slight difference. Then I go back down a little bit again, just gradually to a point where I can hear no difference when I'm bypassing the plugin in and out. Okay, so that's the only thing you need to do with this particular plugin. Now, I will say that there are some alternatives that I could suggest um, to the Pro EQ plugin, which you get a stock here. This is absolutely fine, but some people find that they'd like to use a much more aggressive ramp here. Now, the low cut on here has a limit of 48 decibels. Um, this one that I'm going to suggest, which is TDR Nova by this Tokyo Dawn Records. This is a free plugin. I'll put a link for this down in the description. And the high pass filter on this, as you can see, is much more aggressive. So I've set it at 20 hertz there, and I've got it going up to uh, 72 decibels there in terms of my slope. Very, very aggressive slope indeed. You don't really have to do that, but sometimes I do like it to be a little more aggressive. So just a suggestion there, but if you don't want to download any extra plugins, then definitely go ahead and use the Pro EQ plugin, which comes as stock with Studio One. By the way, have you learned something from this video so far? If you are and you're enjoying it, could you do me a little favor and make sure you hit the like button? That lets YouTube know that other people should see this video as well. Now, if you are enjoying this kind of content from me, especially the Studio One tutorials, could you also make sure you subscribe and ring the bell on YouTube so that you're notified about my future videos? Now, back to this video. Now, I think saturation is highly optional in terms of mastering. You really don't have to add it, but if you are going to add it, I normally add it at this stage. Now, I don't really think that the stock plugins that come with Studio One have great saturation options for mastering. There's a few more saturation options in Studio One version 5, but I still think they're good for mixing rather than mastering. But one thing you could get hold of from the Presonus site is this free saturation knob, which I'll just pull up here. Just go to their site, look for that, download it for free. It's very, very easy to use, as you can see, because it's dominated by this one knob here, which you would just push up as you're listening to the track until you hear a nice amount of saturation. That kind of organic distortion and harmonics that we got from old equipment, which we don't get um, in the digital realm. So this is a nice, easy way to add it, and it is a free solution. The only issue I've got with this plugin is that things definitely get louder as you push this knob up. And again, we can be tricking our ears a little bit into thinking it just sounds better because it's louder. If I'm honest with you, I don't normally use this as an option. I normally use these days a commercial option for that. It's one from IK Multimedia, and I like to use one of their tape machines 
uh, plugins. This adds some nice natural saturation. I've pulled it up here. I'll switch off the saturation knob so that's not going through. Um, and this really sort of gives you a similar type of saturation that you would get from an old tape machine. Now, there are four different models, I think, to choose from. I'll put a link for those in the description. I particularly like this tape machine 80. Now, I have done something here apart from just plonk this plugin on there. I've done a little bit of an increase to the high frequencies, okay? You can see just up here, I've just added a little bit in terms of the high frequency. Sorry, down here, I've had it added a little bit with the high frequency on the playhead just to give it a little bit of sparkle on the top end. Now, you could get that with an EQ, of course, but I've chosen to do it here. I like to do EQ moves with saturation plugins in mastering when I can. I find that it just sounds a little bit sort of more organic than using an actual EQ plugin, but highly optional, as I say. And if you can't afford or don't want to get hold of this plugin or any other commercial plugin, then perhaps try a combination of that saturation knob and just an EQ plugin here. So another optional option, in my opinion, is compression during mastering. Now, I think most of the time in my productions, I do use compression, but I don't want you to feel like you have to. Definitely use it when you have a purpose for it. Now, the purpose for it for me on this occasion is just to tame some of the peaks towards the end of the song where I've got some sort of transients which just poke up above a certain level. I just want to tame them a little bit. And that's going to enable me later on in the limiting stage just to push the overall loudness of the song up that little bit more, which is something that I'll be aiming to do. But the main thing I want to stress here with the compressor is be very gentle with it in this case. So I'm using the stock compressor here from Presonus. Um, I've got the ratio on two to one. That's a pretty good starting point. Nothing too drastic is going to happen in terms of compression with a two to one ratio. I've got my attack set to around about six and a half milliseconds here. Um, this is just so I can make sure that I do grab those transients, but I'm not sort of crushing the track over a longer period of time. It's just dealing with things that are poking up for a moment. And also my release time, I normally start off at around about 60 milliseconds and see where I go from there. But it's highly dependent on your song, on your particular track. What you don't want to get is any kind of pumping effects. Well, that's not actually true. Sometimes Sometimes in some genres of music you do want that pumping effect but for most of us we don't want that pumping effect in fact we just don't want to be aware really at all that there is a compressor there and things are happening so we don't want that to attack too hard on those transits so it's very obvious to listen to and we don't want it to hold on too long and kind of crush the rest of the track now with this particular compressor, I think it's okay for mastering, but I'm actually going to use a different compressor, which is not a stock plugin, but you'll be happy to hear it is free. It's another plugin from Tokyo Dawn Records, and it's called Kotelnikov. I like to use this because it is rather tailored for master compression, okay? That's exactly what it's tailored for. The thing I like about this more than anything else is the control over the release because we've got two controls. We've got a release which is based upon the peaks and we've also got a release which is based upon the RMS or the average value or the average level of the song. Now, of the music at that point, I should say. Now, we can use them in combination with each other or we can use one or the other. I really like this feature in this plugin. I'll put a link for this in the description. And if you want to find out a little bit more about it, I've done a whole video on Tokyo Dawn Records free and paid plugins. I'll put a link for that in the description as well. So another optional option at this point is stereo imaging. Now stereo imaging can really help your track by making it sound much wider or it can destroy your track by making it sound much wider. You have to make a choice with this depending on your music and whether it's going to suit it or not. Now, there's no stereo imaging plugins which come with Studio One, but I'm going to suggest a free one to you now, which I reckon is really good. It's from Isotope and it's called Ozone Imager. You can see it on the screen here now, and it's really just got one control for you to change the sound, and that's this slider here. Okay, there's other controls. We won't get into that. This is your main one, okay? So I'm going to play this end section of the song again here, and I'm going to gradually push that up so that you can hear the difference. From the start.
Okay, I really like that. Now, one thing I have to warn about with stereo imaging is make sure that you do check your mix quite often in mono because this can play havoc with mono mixes um, in terms of causing phase issues. Now, you may think that mono is not important. You're wrong. Mono is important. There's many, many occasions uh, when people are listening to things in mono. Maybe you're listening in mono now on your phone. You should really be listening to tutorials like this with headphones on or with studio monitors. But we'll move past that. So that's a nice plug-in which you could use. There is a commercial option as well, also from Isotope. The uh, Ozone 9 Imager is the one that I'm going to pull up now. In fact, this is what I'm going to leave on my track. The main difference with this is that I get control over different frequencies. So I like to keep the low end intact and not make that very wide at all. I just really like it when that's nice and solidly in the middle but perhaps with the mid and higher ranges I like to add a little bit of width so that's what I've done here and that's what I'm going to be running with on this occasion so normally at this stage I think about finally kind of crafting the sound which I want and I'm going to be using this stock EQ which comes with Studio One for this it's really very capable in terms of this particular task now what I'll be doing at this point is often going between my track and the reference track so I can really hear the differences in tone between the two and I'm broadly listening to that low mid and high ends and as such I generally am only making fairly wide-ranging and gentle changes here you can see the change that I've already made and it's just one here and this is just in the high mids where I've just pushed it up a little bit to add a little bit more clarity especially to some of the vocal parts now I didn't feel the need to do anything to the low end here but you may feel that and quite often if I hadn't done it already in that tape machine plugin which I used earlier for saturation I may be doing a little bit of sparkliness with a high shelf in the EQ here but I already really did that with that saturation plugin so I don't need to do it here in my opinion now if you find yourself sort of adjusting things in this kind of way where you're ending up sort of microscopically with little notches adjusting things here that may be fine but it may also suggest that there's something very specific in the mix maybe a particular instrument where those frequencies are not living in quite the right kind of way. If that's a good way to put it. So that may be an indication that you want to readdress the mix. I don't really like to suggest going back to the mix again. Usually you've spent way too long on that already. But I don't generally personally find that I'm doing sort of minute detail with the EQ at this stage. It's more like broad sweeps. That's just my opinion. Um, and that's the stage at which I think you should be crafting the overall sound here. So now we come to the final and probably most talked about phase of mastering, and that's dealing with the loudness. Now, before we do deal with the loudness, I'd quickly like to take stock of what we've achieved so far, because it may seem as if we've just made tiny, tiny changes which don't add up to much. But I think you'll find that they do add up to quite a big difference when you combine them all together. So I'm going to play this section at the end of the song again, first of all, without any plugins applied whatsoever. Then after a couple of bars or so, I'm going to switch on those plugins so that you can hear the difference. Shoot a helmet from the start. I never thought I'd need to. Never let us drift apart. I never thought I'd miss you. So I think you should be able to hear quite a significant difference there. It's, it's almost as if the whole thing just came to life once we had those plugins applied, making it sound a little bit dead before although it sounded fine to me when I was actually mixing it so we've achieved something significant there without changing the loudness at all I don't think we've really changed the loudness at all we'll check that in a moment so now we need to deal with the loudness now we need to deal with it for some different scenarios well I'm going to deal with a couple of different scenarios the first one is releasing to streaming services such as Spotify um, iTunes YouTube that kind of thing where there are specific requirements now most of them are in line with each other these days um, but you need to double check with the particular streaming platforms you're releasing to the other scenario is if we're burning it to cd 
or we're releasing something where people can download a whole MP3 and then they're not going to be streaming it, they'll just be playing it on their device. Some different things to consider in those different two scenarios. So first of all, what tools are we going to use? Well, we could use the limiter which comes with Studio One. I'll just open that up. Um, it has the controls that we need. It has the seeding control and the threshold control, which are going to be the main controls that I'll be using, except I don't really like to use this plugin. I'm not exactly sure why. I think it's an awesome plugin um, in terms of mixing, um, but I just don't find it's that great um, in terms of mastering. But if you do want to use it, if you're determined to use it, that's absolutely fine. The controls that we're going to be using in the other plugins are exactly the same controls as you'll see here, so you can still follow along. So I'm not going to use that plugin. I'm going to suggest you, um, if you don't want to be spending any money, that this plugin is really good. It's called LoudMax. I'll make sure it's switched on. And it just has really two controls, one to control the peak, which is this slider here, and the other one, which is to control the threshold, which is going to change the kind of average level of our music. And it's really the average level that people hear when they're perceiving loudness. It's not so much the peaks. When the average level of the music comes up, then people feel like it has become louder. Now for our streaming platforms, we have specific requirements to meet for that. So I'll be showing you how to do that in a moment. First of all, let's just have a quick listen to the track and see what values we have um, without applying any limiting at all. Again, I just want to check this. So I'm going to switch off all those plugins again. And what I want you to do is look at the metering over on this side where we can see something called LUFS or LUFS, LUFS, however you pronounce it, I don't know. I just want to make sure that that is reset at the moment. And then we're going to have a listen to that section again at the end and see what kind of values we're getting for LUFS. Heal me from the start I never thought I'd need to Never let us drift apart Okay, it's about minus 16 at the moment. Our target is uh, minus 14 or so for the streaming platforms. I'll reset that again. I'll move back. I'll just switch on our plugins again. Let's see if we did make any difference with all those plugins. Heal me from the start No, it's still around about minus 16, so I was right. There really wasn't any change in kind of volume as such after we'd added those plugins. So let's make that change. Before we change the average volume, I just want to quickly set the peak. It's very easy to do with this second slider down here. I'm just going to drag that down to minus 1, okay? Um, I'm not exactly sure of the reason for minus 1. I think it's to account for variations um, in the digital to analog conversion, which is always going to happen when people listen to music. So um, their stereo system, their car stereo, their phone, whatever it is, however they're listening to it, it's going to be converted from digital back to analog so that they can hear it. I believe there's some minor variations in different equipment. So we go down to minus one just to take account for that. So we can make sure that we're never actually peaking um, when that conversion happens. So we've set that to minus one as is required by Spotify. Um, I'm going to go back and play the song again and then I'm going to gradually adjust this slider, this second slider down here. Things are going to start to sound louder and I just want to make sure we push up those extra couple of decibels so we get up to around about minus 14. Let's see how we go. Do the hell me from the start. I never thought I'd need to Never let us drift apart Okay, and that's about right. Now, I should mention at this point, I'm not doing this exactly right. This is just for demonstration purposes. What you really want to do is meter this over a long period of time, probably over most of the song, rather than just focus on small sections like this and try and get the loss value for the whole song to be in the right ballpark. But that would be fine there around this minus 13.8. It doesn't have to be exactly minus 14. So that's how I would use this plugin to achieve the loudness that I want. 
Now, the other thing that I like to do, in fact, the thing I almost always do is use a commercial plugin, which I'm going to show you very, very quickly now. Um, it's not the cheapest of plugins, so I'm not going to push it too much because I think you can achieve your results with this loud max, or as I say, um, using the stock plugin with Persona Studio One. But the one I actually use more often than not is Ozone 9's Maximizer. And the reason for it is this. I can set my true peak here, which I've already done to minus one. And then I can, in here, set my target loss value. I can switch this to learn threshold. Then I can set that target to minus 14 as I have. And let's just reset this here. Now what I'm going to do is play the song. And what this plugin is going to do is adjust that threshold for me until I get near my target. So let's have a look and see how it does. Shoot a helmet from the start. I never thought I'd need to. Never let us drift apart. I never thought I'd miss you. So it's done its job. I'll switch off learn and then that's locked in. The reason I like to use this is because I think it has some slightly nicer algorithms here in terms of the limiting. Um, and also, I do like that feature. Now, again, I would normally do that over the pretty much over the course of the whole song. Just let it play and see what it calculates automatically by itself. As I say, don't have to use that commercial plugin, but definitely worth a look. So I'll close that down. I'm going to go back to my Loud Max plugin now. Now, let's say our scenario is a little bit different. Let's say we're releasing um, as a downloadable MP3. Well, now things are quite different. We can really push things to the limit now because we're not restricted by any requirements. In fact, I can make my song sound much, much louder by pushing this threshold down even further. However, it's going to come to a point where it really doesn't sound good, where we're going to get kind of pumping effects and all of that kind of thing that we don't want to hear in our music. It's not going to be transparent anymore. So don't go crazy on this. You still want to retain, in my opinion, especially in this type of music, some dynamics in the song. You don't want everything just to be sounding like it's on full all the time without anywhere to go. It's like you're already on full. How do you crescendo? You can't because you're already on full. So I'll just say use caution here, but probably, probably you're going to be going a bit further with something like a downloadable MP3 than you do with the requirements they have on Spotify. One thing you want to probably do at this point is listen to a few different reference tracks, the kind of songs that people might be listening to that they've already downloaded and may be listening to alongside your song and see what their loudness values are like. And you may want to try and match that. So that's all we have to it for today. And that's the last stage in our mastering. Thank you so much for joining me in today's video. If you've got any questions whatsoever, please do ask in the comments down below and I'll do my very best to help you out. If you did enjoy this video, then make sure you hit the like button for me. That helps me out because it lets YouTube know that other people should see this video as well. If you do like this kind of content, especially tutorials about Studio One, then make sure you subscribe and ring the bell on YouTube so that you're notified about my future videos. Also, if you'd like to help out the channel, check out my Patreon page for as little as $1 per month. You can help me to help you by making more and more of these tutorial videos. And I'll see you in the next video. Shoot a helmet from the start. I never